Hello, Miss Simonson says here. Welcome to Midnight How by Claire Hutton, and this is going to be Chapter Fourteen, published, of course, by Scholastic. So let's get into it. Chapter Fourteen: The Two Medicine Campsite. The Two Medicine. Apparently, that's the name of the campsite. Two Medicine. I'm going to Two Medicine Campsite. Aye, aye, Captain. All right. The Two Medicine Campsite was pretty. On the edge of a lake surrounded by evergreen trees. Ooh. We set up the tents and put the food in storage lockers, which are like big metal boxes to keep the food safe from animals. Haley, Lily, Bonnie, and I were sharing one of the four-person tents. It was going to be a tight squeeze. There was really only enough room for four people if everyone was in her sleeping bag. We took turns going in to unroll our sleeping bags and put our backpacks down. When it was my turn, I felt the bottom of the tent. Yikes. It was cold and hard and even with the tarp underneath. Oh, I was probably going to be tossing and turning and freezing all night. Clearly, I was just a soft city girl at heart. Once the tents were ready, it was starting to get dark and Lily and I and the other kids who had brought telescopes began setting them up around the campsite. We... <coughs> Sorry. That was weird. We... <laughs> Let's do this. Um, ba, 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 ba. Lily and I and the other kids who had brought the telescopes began setting them around the campsite. We weren't going to stargaze until after dinner, but it would be really dark and we wanted to get ready so we wouldn't have to fiddle with them too much when too much in the full darkness. Heads up! came a call from behind me, and I flinched as Anderson lurched into me. A second later, his frisbee bounced off my telescope. Hey, I said indignantly. Bonnie came over and picked up the frisbee. You should be more careful, she said, smiling at Anderson. Sorry, ladies, sometimes I just can't be contained, he said. I rolled my eyes and readjusted my telescope as he walked off. But Bonnie smiled and ran her fingers through her red curls. Do you think he's kind of cute? She whispered. I thought about it. There was nothing really wrong with Anderson's looks, but he was just so jittery and jokey that I couldn't think of as cute. Not really, do you? She blushed a little and shrugged. I guess, she said. I like funny. The teachers got a campfire going and soon the smell of cooking hot dogs and burgers wafted over the campfire. I wandered around over to Lily, who was reading something in her notebook. I'm starving, she moaned. Doesn't it smell good? I'm not really into burgers, I reminded her, but I am getting hungry. Do you think Jack remembered to bring veggie burgers? Sorry, I forgot, she said. And yes, I think Jack probably remembers. She gave me a sly little smile. What does that mean? I asked. I just think that Jack likes you, she said. He's been looking at you when you're not watching. Was he? It was a flattering thought, but I shook my head. Jack likes everybody, I said. He's just nice to me because I live in his house and our moms are like best friends. Okay, Lily teased in a sing-song voice. Anything you say. Is there something in the water here? I asked. Bonnie was just telling me she thinks Anderson is cute. Really, said Lily. Hmm, I could see them together, actually. Interesting choice. Now, Jack. Shh, I said, and I could feel myself turning bright red. Jack was walking towards us, holding a plate of food. Lily giggled. <laughs> hey, he said to both of us. Here, Mayor Sol, I got them to fix yours and Haley's first so they wouldn't be contaminated with the meat grease. That was really nice of you, Lily said, nudging me with her foot. Thanks, Jack, I said. No problem, he answered. Mr. Samuel cooked the burger, but I brought you some of my secret coleslaw and potato salad. He nodded encouragingly, waiting for me to take a bite. I took a spoonful of coleslaw and smiled at him. Mmm, I said, good. Thanks, he said, looking proud, and then turned to Lily. The meat stuff should be ready now. Come on. He headed back toward the food. Lily leaped up to her feet and hurried after him. So hungry, she said, waving to me. 
I followed them slowly, looking around. Everyone was getting plates of food, settling into small groups and talking quietly. I sat down next to Haley and she smiled at me. Doesn't the fire smell so good? She said, I love campfires. Me too, I said. Outside the circle of the light made by the fire, the forest was dark around us. The light flickered over everyone's faces and the stars shone brightly overhead. As people finished eating, some of the kids got out their flashlights and left the fire, playing flashlight tag further away in the clearing. Stay out of the woods, Mr. Samuel announced. We don't want anyone to be lost. Remember, there are wild animals out there. Put all your food in the trash and the leftovers in the black plastic bags so we can secure them. We don't want to attract bears. Or wolves, mountain lions, or coyotes, added Mrs. Abrams, another one of our teacher chaperones. Yikes, I said, and they shivered. I didn't want to think about wild animals roaming outside of our tents. Don't worry, said Haley. I doubt we'll see any animals at all, as noisy as this group's being, she looked wistfully. Time for stargazing, Lily announced when everyone was done eating. I hurried to my telescope. Bonnie, Amber, Haley, and Jack joined me, and I showed them Venus, Jupiter, and Mars. And we were even able to see the rings of Saturn. This is awesome, said Jack. What about the moon, said Bonnie. Let's look at the moon. I focused the telescope on the moon and pointed out the craters. The moon was yellow and almost full, and it hung just above the treetops. There's sort of a ring around it, said Haley. What is that? It's from the moonlight refracting off ice crystals in the upper atmosphere, I explained. It's like a rainbow, but from the moon. Wow, Haley said. I glanced over and saw that she was smiling. After everyone had a chance to look through the telescopes, Lily called us back to the fireside for dessert and storytelling. As I was heading over, Jack grabbed my arm and pulled me back behind the others. Can I talk to you for a second, he asked. I felt a flutter in my stomach. Hmm. No matter what I said about just being friends with Jack, he was just so cute. Was it true that he liked me? Sure, I said. I've never been able to get Haley to come along on anything like this before, he said. She's shy and people have made fun of her last year because she's more interested in animals than people. He hesitated. Anyway, it's just good that you got her to come. Well, I said and shrugged, I like Haley. I know, he said, it's nice. He smiled, you're nice. He squeezed my arm. I felt myself blushing. We stood there silently for a moment. Anyway, he said, come on, you've got to get one of my special raspberry chocolate brownies before they're gone. Once we were all sitting around the fire, Lily pointed out some constellations and told the ancient Greek myths behind their names. Jack was next to me and I leaned against him just the tiniest bit, ooh, as I ate my brownie. His arm felt warm and solid and I couldn't help glancing at him sideways a little. He glanced back at me and smiled and my insides jumped with happy nervousness. The fire was cackling, the brownie was delicious, lap woos g double o d good after lily finished talking becca from astronomy club got up um she said twisting her shaggy black hair in her fingers this is a true story my brother told me it happened to some kids he knew when he was our age right here at this campground these three kids were best friends and they convinced their parents to let them go camping by themselves they had a great time fishing and hiking and cooking over a campfire but when it got dark, they started hearing weird noises in the woods. They heard branches cracking and leaves rustling. It sounded like something big was making its way towards them through the woods, getting closer and closer. And then they started hearing a terrible groaning noise like this. One of the guys got scared and he wanted to call their parents to pick them up. But his friends laughed <laughs> and said the noises were just an owl or something. He finally got mad and went to bed. He was almost asleep when he heard the horrible screaming and banging around. So he ran out of the tent. It was just his friends yelling and hitting a pot with spoons to scare him. 
So he went back into the tent and zipped it closed. A little while later, he was almost asleep when he heard his friends screaming and yelling again and even shaking the tent. He totally wasn't going to fall for it. So he put his head under his pillow and fell asleep. The next morning, when he woke up, there was no one in the tent. His friends weren't in the campsite, but on the ground was all torn up around where the fire had been, like something with huge claws had dug in the ground. And then when he looked back at the tent, he saw ragged scratches on the side, as if something with paws as big as his head had tried to claw it open. Becca lowered her voice and walked closer to us listeners. They never found his friends. The woods were full of park rangers searching and they didn't find anything except a few scraps of cloth that might have come from one boy's shirt. A year later, the boy who was left behind came back to the campsite. He walked into the woods and saw something terrible. She paused, looked around at us. I leaned forward to hear in the dark of the night, he saw boo, boo. Suddenly she screamed at the top of her lungs. We all shrieked. I realized I was gripping Jack's arm and giggled. Sorry, I said sleepily, letting go. She scared me. I'll protect you, Jack said with mock seriously, patting me on the shoulder. Everyone was laughing. It was just a joke story, a scary setup to make us jump. But my eyes went back to the moon so close to full and a chill swept over me despite the warmth of the fire. And that's chapter.